Good morning. This is uh, unusual for me as it is unusual for you to see me and Fernie up with no other people around apart from Joe and Hannah uh, helping out. It's a Wednesday evening but you'll be watching this on Sunday morning so good morning. For most people 2020 has been a real challenge. For many families there have been significant life events that haven't been able to be shared in the usual way, other uh, things have been postponed and cancelled. For us as a family, it's mum and dad's diamond anniversary in June, which we can celebrate. Fraser finished university and graduated uh, in June, but there was no ceremony at all. Uh, my nephew Donald finished six year at Knox Academy in Haddington with no exams and no sense of closure at all. And while in the scheme of things, none of these were particularly big events, certainly not in the same realm as losing loved ones or jobs, it just emphasizes that for everybody, uh, COVID has affected each of our lives. And I do mention six year at Knox Academy for a reason, because in 1985, that is where I was. And as you see the picture there, this was a prefix photo from that year. It was without doubt one of the best years of my life. I know that for a lot of people, uh, school wasn't great, but I loved it. I had a great time. And uh, as with many things in life, such as work and education, it comes down to who your peer group were and what the teachers were like or your bosses were like. When I was in sixth year, there was a real uh, spiritual interest in my peer group of about 20 or 30. And I re remember vividly some prolonged discussions in our youth fellowship meetings with that sort of number being involved. That obviously made its way through to the staff room in Knox Academy because I also remember fairly vividly uh, a discussion in six year study physics, that's advanced higher as it is now, with our teacher, Mr. Catlow. And he was asking if he could join one of our discussions. Clearly being a, a physics teacher, he's a scientist, and he said that um, there's no real problem with a designer or creator God. He could believe that the universe with its laws of thermodynamics and motion, gravity, uh, gas laws and such, had an intelligent designer behind it. I couldn't believe that Jesus Christ could be human and God. I remember being slightly puzzled about that. Surely if God can design and create the universe, he could become human. But he was having absolutely none of it. And the truth is, for many people, that has been the case for the past 2,000 years. In fact, one of the major reasons for the Church Council at Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed, was because there was a major dispute about the divinity of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the Nicene Creed, and you may recall that uh, this creed or statement of belief is the basis for the 12 essentials of a relevant faith that make up this series. And it's no mistake that in this season of Advent we come to the fourth topic in our series, which is God became human. And I want to consider three of the statements of the Nicene Creed which pertain particularly to this, uh, and they are begotten, 
not made. Jesus was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary. And we believe that Jesus became man. Human beings are made in the image of God, whatever your interpretation of the first three chapters of the book of Genesis is, you come to the inescapable truth that human beings are designed by a loving God for a relationship with him. Megan explained that well to us last Sunday in our kids' talk. Human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation, the only creatures made in his image, and as we've been thinking recently, the only creatures that are eternal. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 reminds us of that. God has also set eternity in the hearts of men. There's something special about human beings that sets us apart from all other creatures. And Psalm 139 reminds us of the incredible truth of that when David declares for you created my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made your eyes saw my unformed body human beings are individually handcrafted by a God who is a God of purpose and design who made us and cares for us. But when it comes to Jesus, John in his Gospel, chapter 1, tells us, this is the King James Version, and the Word, that is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him or made him known. Jesus was made. These verses, these verses mention twice that Jesus was begotten of the Father. Begotten is a word that isn't used a great deal these days. It simply means to be the father of. Matthew chapter 1 with its genealogy, as you may know, lists Abraham, begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah, Judah begot Perez, and so on and so on. To begot someone, you have to be of the same species. So when John says Jesus was the only begotten of the Father, he was saying Jesus was God. Was it made or in the image of God? He was in his God. God can only be God. God. And you may know verse 1 of John's Gospel, chapter 1, where John says Jesus, i.e. the Word, was with God in the beginning. Jesus is eternal. He is the eternal Son of God, begotten, not created. Eternity is something that our finite minds can't really get our heads around. We are beings that are part of this space-time continuum. We exist in time, but God doesn't he simply is? And this God, as we'll explore later in the series, is a triune God. It exists in three persons at the same time. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it is this second person of the Trinity who chose to step into time 2,000 years ago by taking on a human body, nature to be born to a young woman in a backwater town called Bethlehem. We know that this woman was called Mary 
kind of a Nicene Creed. A statement relating to this event was, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Incarnate simply means embodied in human form, or as John put it, became flesh or took on flesh. Jesus, as we've already considered, wasn't made. He wasn't the product of the union of human male and female gametes. His DNA did not derive from a father and mother. When the angel Gabriel visited Mary to tell her that she will be with child and give birth to her son, her question wasn't why. It was, how will this be since I am a virgin? And as you may know, Gabriel replied, the Holy Spirit will come down to you and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. God in human form has to be God, therefore as mysterious and difficult as it is to understand the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, was responsible for the implantation of the cells that developed into the baby Jesus. An event that had been prophesied by uh, Isaiah several centuries previously. And you may know this verse, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now Isaiah lived about 750 years before Jesus was born in the time of the kings of Judah, before the people of Judah were exiled to Babylon. And you may recall that the Old Testament narrative records that the exile lasted 70 years uh, and then God brought back some of the Jews to Jerusalem under the auspices of Ezra and Nehemiah. But from that time until John the Baptist, 400 years, there were no prophets speaking the word of God to the Jews. The Pharisees have become a prominent voice within Judaism with their 613 laws that had to be followed. And it was at this time Jesus was born. 400 years of waiting for God to speak. It was a, a dramatic pause of divine proportion, if you like. And this time it wasn't a prophet who was going to speak, but it was God himself. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God's timing is always right. And as we read last week in Romans chapter 5 that it was just the right time Jesus stepped into human history. This verse also tells us that human beings were powerless to do anything about the broken relationship with God. But Jesus could. But it meant that he would have to die first. And in Galatians chapter 4 we read, When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. I'm not sure about you, but I sometimes you know, think about the timing of the incarnation. Why then? The Bible says it was the right time. And it was a time that had fully come. Some of you might recall the interaction between God and Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. 
God had promised Abraham while he was in our a land for him and his descendants. He had travelled over many years and eventually come to the land which was to be Canaan. But when he arrived there, God said to him that this wouldn't become a reality for his descendants for another 400 years. And the reason he gave for that he said, for the sin of the Amorites, Canaanites, had not yet reached its full measure. God foreknew he was going to judge the extreme wickedness of the people living in the land of Canaan, but he was patient and gave them opportunity to change their evil ways, but they didn't. He sank further into evil and depravity, and the judgment came when Joshua, and the children of Israel conquered Canaan. And I wonder if that was what Paul was alluding to when he said the time had fully come. The line of David uh, had become more and more distant from God and the hearts were now completely at odds with their God. As Ezekiel put it, they had hearts of stone. Another thing that uh, I sometimes consider that makes it the right time is the geopolitical scene at the time of Jesus' birth, what was called the Pax Romana. The Roman Empire was largely at peace when Jesus was born, which meant the spread of the gospel by moving between countries and continents was relatively straightforward. And while the rule of the Roman Empire had a significant effect on where Jesus was born, as Caesar Augustus ordered the censors requiring Mary and Joseph to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, it was really the religious culture of the time, which when Mary became pregnant, that meant she would have been very much shunned and ostracised in that culture, in that society. Who's going to believe she was a virgin? Her fiancé Joseph certainly didn't, and it required a supernatural intervention in his life with a dream to change his mind about quietly divorcing her. We shouldn't underestimate quite how much gossip and hostility Mary would have been subject to being pregnant in her unmarried state. And yet her response when Gabriel gave her the news was, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. She understood who her God was and was willing to serve him no matter the cost for herself. So we have Jesus was begotten, not made. Jesus was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary. And finally, Jesus became man. Jesus didn't just take on flesh when he became human. But as Philippians chapter 2, which was read to us earlier, tells us, he took on human nature. We read there, he who was in very nature God. And then he took on another nature, that being human. Jesus had two natures, divine, God, and human. The Bible also refers to Jesus as the second Adam. Like Adam, Jesus didn't have an earthly father and was not a product of the mixing of genetic material as every human being has been since the time of Adam. And this is important because Adam was responsible for the original sin we were thinking about last week. The result of his disobedience was 
the open, honest, untainted relationship with God, that perfect harmony Andy Bathgate was mentioning last week, that was completely destroyed by Adam's disobedience and sin. So if Adam was responsible for the separation, another Adam would be required to restore the relationship and sort out the universal problem of sin. And the words that we read in Philippians tell us how that was accomplished. Jesus became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Human nature and perfection was nailed to the cross to pay the price for the sinful nature of every human being that has ever lived. Crucifixion was a punishment reserved for the lowest of the low in society. When Philippians says that Jesus humbled himself, it really means it. Jesus gave up the wonder of heaven to die a death that was associated with the lowest status in society. There was nowhere lower that Jesus could go in the human sense. He stood to the lowest place possible in the Roman Empire, so that there was no one below him. Jesus sank to the lowest position humanly possible. Uh, but if you think you're low in the pecking order of society, Jesus has stood lower so that he could offer the opportunity to be lifted for all of humankind. I mentioned at the start the youth fellowship meetings that we had in my six year at school. And one of those first meetings that we had, we uh, had a discussion about a, a short piece of prose called The Long Silence. And this pictured the Day of Judgment uh, and a number of accusations being made from various groups of people. And this is how it ends. How lucky God was to live in heaven, where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear, no hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? God leads, leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because they had suffered the most, a Jew, an equal, a person from their early life. Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a Lidomite child. In the centre of the vast plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury, and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die, so there could be no doubt he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people who assembled. When the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered a word. No one moved. For suddenly all knew that God had already served the sentence. It was only possible for God to suffer 
if he became human. That is one of the reasons that Jesus had to be human, so that he could suffer instead of us, so that a holy and just God could relate to his creatures again to restore that perfect harmony that had existed before Adam sinned. For many of my friends that night in Haddington, uh, they'd never considered Jesus living a life of suffering. Some of them didn't even know that it was referring to Jesus in the text. Jesus took on human nature. And Philippians 2 reminds us that he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant being made a human likeness. Jesus described himself as the Son of Man and in Matthew chapter uh, and Matthew and Luke he tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And he also said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In his human nature, Jesus served others, caring for their physical, and emotional, psychological needs. And as you all know, even took on the role of washing the disciples' feet. He became the perfect example for all human natures to follow and to attempt to emulate. But Jesus is both Son of Man and Son of God. And as Son of God, he rose victoriously to intercede on our behalf before his Father, a holy God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, this is what we read. Therefore, since we, all Christians, have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he didn't sin. These words in Hebrews tell us emphatically that Jesus experienced everything that we do. He truly was Emmanuel, God with us. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be isolated or alone. And he knows what it is to be, pain, to be in pain and let down by those close to him. Whatever your situation is this morning, whatever your need is, he knows. And Jesus continues to invite us to come to him, to believe in him, to repent of our sin and to follow him. And in so doing to have life and life to the full. And we were doing the prayer walk around the area a couple of months ago. We're reminding ourselves about those verses in John chapter 10 which tell us that the devil, the evil one, comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life, and not just life, but an abundant life. Satan wants to suck the joy out of living, but Jesus wants to give us that abundant life which we were made for. But sin has destroyed. The birth of Jesus Christ is a fact of history. Here we are, 2,000 years after the event, just about to celebrate that fact again. What we believe about the nature of that birth will determine what we believe about the purpose of that birth. And what the motivation behind it was. For me, the unshakable truth of 
John 3 verse 16 says it all. We heard this last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Our Father, we just take time to give you thanks for sending Jesus. Father, you were willing to disturb that uh, perfection in heaven. Jesus, you were willing to come to this earth for us and behind it all was a love for uh, humankind despite its sin and Father was so grateful that Jesus took on humanity took on himself flesh took on the nature of humankind and when he offered himself on the cross, made it possible for us as human beings once again to enter into that perfect harmony that we were designed for. Father, our prayer is that this Advent time we will just appreciate a bit more of the love that came down at Christmas of the love that was the motivation for sending Jesus Father help us to worship help us to worship with hearts that are full of love for you and help that love to spill over into the people so that the people we meet will see Jesus that is our desire this Christmas that people will meet with Jesus whether it be through another human being or even in some supernatural way Father come this morning we just give you praise for your wonderful son our Lord Jesus in whose name we pray Amen <laughs>